And now, Tim Dillon is going to hell with Tim Dillon and Ray Kump. Welcome to Tim Dillon's Going to Hell. What's interesting about the uh, the thing there is that Osama bin Laden's eating a bucket of fried chicken in the opening. Well, you know, he throw him in the ocean, might as well give him chicken. Yeah, but I didn't realize that that was a graphic. Like somebody, the graphic of the show is like a bunch of dictators and, and evil people sitting at a table, and is then that, Osama's eating fried, is fried chicken. chicken halal? I don't know, but Are we I don't, in a Charlie Hebdo situation now. I don't know if the reason that he was eating fried chicken is that was one of the things that was discovered in his compound. Like, was it? I don't know. I'm just wondering how did they get that inspiration? I don't even know. Was I don't 80, know. Eighties any... porn and fried chicken. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. I mean, that, listen, that's 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 the USA. That's what it is. Jessa Reed with us. Hi. Um, can we rewind that? I feel like yeah. I can you rewind that, big? Shannon? I just want to see. I want you to see because it's interesting because I noticed something new about that opening. Every time that we do it, and uh, it's Those are the, scary it's eyes, creepy, yeah, man. scary eyes, and that's us. We're falling to hell. Oh, okay. Well, that explains. Yeah, there you go. Now we sit at this table, which kind of looks sweating. like the Last Supper, I guess. It's like Hitler. Is that Mao? Oh, Mao's and eating pizza. Or Mao's cheese. eating pizza, and then uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, and then wow. Bin Laden's eating yeah. fried chicken. Yeah, well so, catered. Uh, you're in good company. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm it's excited. interesting to show that, and then we're like, yeah. we have a guest. Uh, <laughs> Does kind of fit me. Thanks for coming on. Well, no, uh, Jess, I I known about for a little while. I love everything you do on social media. I think it's very funny. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Thank you. But I your your story on this is not happening. Which if you've not seen it, go right now to YouTube. If you type in her name, Jessa Reed, J E S S A R E E D, you, it comes up right away. It's the standout for me story from that from the new season of This Is Not Happening. It's like amazing. Wow, thank you. It's about I've seven, ever seen. Yeah, it's really wow. amazing. It's seventy. You know why? And let me tell you one of the reasons I think it's so great is that at no point during it do you feel comfortable, <laughs> and at no point during it do you want it to end. <laughs> that, that is, is why wow. that is a it is great. High praise. That is why it's great because at no point you're like, oh, this is like rough, and but you're like, but keep going because it's like. This is crazy. And well, I know that too. It's not like peppered with laugh points. Like yeah. So like, you'll have like this like gap of just kind of people. You could tell how like just disturbed they are. Yeah. But then like a second later, they're just hysterically laughing. Yeah. Yeah. But you let them be disturbed. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the thing. Yeah. It was a it was a um a tough one to write because to keep people on your side and it's like sixteen minutes and then it was a really tough one to run because I was living in in Delaware. And uh, getting it ready for the show, it just didn't work. You know, I didn't have access to a lot of storytelling shows, so it just didn't, like, I'm having to do this at, like, an improv theater, and right. I just wanted to stop halfway through and be like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry that yeah. you have to do this right well, now. What's good about it, we talked about it before the show, what's good about it is that it's 17 minutes, and it's, like, halfway between a stand-up set and a podcast. It's, like, just enough time. Was it 17 on the show? Yeah. It's I se- couldn't even tell. I think was, yeah. they edited it down to, like, 14. There's, okay. a, there's some taken out of it. There's a whole thing where I tried to just turn it back into meth oh, and uh, okay. that, i think that got cut out okay. of it. It's, yeah. a, w- w- it's a great chunk because it introduces people to you i think in a way that makes them want to know more about you right. listen to your podcast you have a podcast too called the mormon and the meth head yeah which is uh which one uh, are you yeah <laughs> you met this your partner yeah. at a comedy festival i did and uh we met a few we met in 2014 at the comedy festival and he was just a straight up mormon <laughs> And uh, like legit, still in the life, still in the life, and he's younger than me, and he he was like shy, and he tried to t- like like uh, I did, I was going through a mom comedy phase for a minute, like trying to hide out uh, like a normal person, yeah. and so then he was like, oh you're a you're a mom, like in the back of this van where he's all nervous, and then yeah. within 15 minutes into this drive, I'm like, so when I was on meth, yeah. the CIA taught me uh, taught a bunch of us how to steal identities because of the reptilian agenda, and yeah. he was like, oh shit. Uh, so then three years later, we're back at that festival while we're both working there. Yeah. 
and he has since left Mormonism. Okay, wow. And he Did left. Did you have anything to do with that? No, but okay. I am. I'm. Uh, I do have little to do with his uh, yeah. his journey into the. <laughs> okay. I, I was like delicious. Someone to corrupt. Yeah. Uh, he was 28 when he left Mormonism, which is the same age I was when I got clean, and we started talking about that. We both re-entered society. Yeah. But like for me, it was having my first job, learning how to eat with dentures, getting my yeah. driver's license back. His was like drinking his first beer, <laughs> fucking doggy style. Wow. Like just yeah. this. Yeah. Totally different. His was more fun probably. Yeah. And so I don't think so. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. What's interesting, one of the things I love in the thing, and it is about, I'm not going to tell anyone what the actual thing's about because I want you to watch it, but it, 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 it involves meth. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Like I'm not going to say what it is. Go watch it. It's worth the watch. Um, one of my favorite things is the description of what you used to wear. Yeah. I think is amazing. Yeah. Is that, is that somewhat accurate? To, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that was one of the best things. Where did you get the tiara? Uh, I went through several tiaras, and it became a thing where people like to be the person that buys my tiara. And when we did a photo shoot for the, uh, for the Mormon and the Meth Head podcast, yeah. I got to wear... A uh, tiara and a prom dress. Yeah. While we did that, it so was you weren't like you weren't like robbing a quinceanera. No, uh, I mean I was. The, the, there was the FBI uh, windbreaker. I was love stolen. the FBI windbreaker. Yeah. The Barbie <laughs> yeah. backpack was ironic, I, but then amazing. it became a thing. Yeah. Now let's go back because you because meth is like very interesting. I tried to get this guy who wrote a book called Meth Land on the show. All of these people, you know, you try to get them on. They've got better, they've got better things to do, apparently. I'm like, all right, I get it. It's in an apartment, whatever. Um, you you tried this accidentally. I did. Yeah. My mother was a meth addict when I was a kid, or crank yeah. is what it was back then. And so that was like the one thing I swore I would never touch. Okay. And so I Where'd start you grow up? Uh, Portland, between Portland and Delaware. My oh. dad lives in Delaware. I spent most of my time in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Rural, or was it like... Portland, the city. Oh, the city. Okay. Yeah. Before it was the place to be. Right. Uh, I still would... I would quibble with the term place to be. But. Yeah. <laughs> as, as would I. Yeah. <laughs> Those quotes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it a coal town back then or something? Or No, it was, it was just a... Uh, just a city. It was just a regular yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And uh, and now it's this whole other expensive thing. thing. Yeah. Um, but my mom was a tweaker and okay. I swore I would never do that. And I started doing stand up when I was 21, but I'd already been like married. I got married when I was 16. I already had a kid. Um, and I was kind of, uh, marketable as a stand up already because I could, re I was young and could relate to the college kids, but also had already like been a wife for five years and could relate to the, and it was a pretty decent career trajectory I had. But I just partied my ass off. Yeah. What made you get married that young? I got knocked up by a pastor's son. Wow. Okay. Yeah. As like a way to get out of going to church, which doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Once you get knocked up by one of them, you totally have to go to church. All forever. Time. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. in it forever. Doesn't. Uh, yeah. And I'm not cut out because they believe in like women submitting and stuff. So I wasn't. That good. wasn't the move. Was he like a bad boy pastor's son or is he like. No, this was another like, ooh, delicious. You're, <laughs> you're, oh, you're corrupting him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then uh, turn him out. And so <laughs> um, I would get so drunk at the comedy show that the next day I was getting pulled over at 10 o'clock in the morning driving to the next gig. These are like triple runs on That's the West Coast. That's impressive. Yeah. Because they used to get free drinks all night at bars that you did shows at. Yeah. It's not like the same where you get drink tickets and shit. It used right. to just be like a free-for-all. Yeah. And so somebody had told me if you do a couple bumps of Coke you sober up enough that you don't have a hangover and you're not drunk the next yeah. day. And I'd already gone through my Coke phase because I was 21. We used then. to believe, I started doing Coke at like, I think I was 12 or 13. I don't yeah. know, it was the summer going in eighth grade. And like, we always believed that if you did an upper and a downer, you were sober. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is, you know, no, exactly. We believe it feels that. that. It feels we that way. We believe that if you did an upper and a downer, you were even. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I really thought that. So I, I thought I was, I'd asked the bartender in Butte, Montana, for a, a line of white, which does not mean Coke. Oh, wow. Montana. Okay. And this is before meth. This was actually crank, which looks close to Coke. It's yeah. like dirty, like somebody dropped it on the floor to Coke. Gotcha. And so is I it, just. Is crank crystal meth? Is that what it is? So now it's like, it, it changes all the time because of the chemicals. They make the chemicals illegal. And so right. then they have to change. So it used right. to be this dark, this white powdery substance that got you a completely different kind of high. And so that's what I got hooked on. And then it was meth within a few months. Gotcha. Um, and so I did the line and then 
my head, like, I'd never experienced a pain like that. Like it burns so bad. And I had done a huge rail just yeah. kind of trying to show off for these dudes. And when right. I sat up, I think the rail was for all three of us to share. Cause you don't need that much meth. And when I sat up, they were looking at me like, what? <laughs> and then I was just gone for days, just wow. tweaking, trying like folding the tech. Cause there's nothing to do in the hotel rooms, folding and unfolding the towels, just bugged out of my mind, spent all of the money I made on the shows buying prepaid calling cards and just calling everyone back at, cause this wasn't even cell phones yet. This is like 98. Really? Yeah. Wow. Calling everyone. 98. Nine, That's I what am. I was yeah. doing. Shit. Yeah. Nothing was better than a late nineties habit. You know what I mean? I gotta be honest with you. In my opinion, nothing was better. No cell phones. Nah. No, you're out there. And when you're when you're out there, yeah, it's just you. Yep. In that hotel room. Yep. Great. Oh, so great. Well, and I was great, calling you know I mean. everyone, being like, Meh, like uh, crank is great. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. One of my favorite things about the story is like I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was convinced. Here's the thing: I had this this sensation my entire life. Is gonna, now I'm going to show how weird I am. This sensation my entire life that like there was a curtain somewhere. Like I just was. I was never trying to. I didn't become an addict because I was trying to escape pain or whatever. I was just very disillusioned with reality, and I felt like I was on the Truman Show or something. Just like it, there's got to be more than this, right? And I felt like when I got high on psychedelics or speed, like that I could find the curtain. Was the sensation, and so I was just like, "Here it is." Right. Here's what I was looking for, yeah. and so I was just immediately hooked because right. I just felt like I had I got to rise out of the yeah. matrix, right? Or whatever, yep. and so and that was that. I was I just went home. I did one more show or one more run, but I had been awake for two weeks. <laughs> And I trip as I'm getting on stage. I've already dropped so much weight. I had a bunch of jokes about being uh, chunky back then. And so uh, I was already too thin to be doing those jokes and from being strung out. And then I uh, was just saying my jokes without any inflection or comedic timing. I love the idea of like a, an emaciated meth head with <laughs> fat material. Yeah, that's all I like, that's all you I, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, as I, lo I love the image of that. Yeah. God, comedy. What's great about at the end of this podcast, we're really going to, well, comedy is the disease. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's, that's why I wanted to have her on because I'm like, really? I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you can get rid of meth. Yeah. You you know, but <laughs> this shit is like the worst. What were you going to say? No, I was just curious. You did that one big line. You said you were up for three days. Was that all off to, off to one line? Yeah, yet? for she the whole rest of the run. I think by the last night yeah. I was trying to, because it is kind of a blur. I think by the last night I was trying to score more. Right. But I already in Portland was hanging out in like the after hours scene. Yeah. And so that I knew exactly great. where to go to get it. Yeah. I knew who the meth dealers were. So Late 90s, there was a little resurgence of heroin. Going on on the East Coast. I don't know if that was. It probably was Seattle and Portland too. I guess probably right? the whole, there were, uh, and we, the whole time yeah. I was a tweaker, we had never heard of meth. In where here. I was, no, ne I'd never yeah, heard it of it. Still in the late nineties. Late nineties. I'll tell you exactly what we were doing. We were doing coke. We were smoking it. We were freebasing it. Pills, Vikings, Perkies, all the you know. But ne we had not. I didn't hear about meth. I'm trying to think. Probably, maybe I was like 2000 and 2003. I started to hear a little, tiny little bit about it, but not a lot. Yeah. And it was really to like 2010 when it started to become something where I was like, the books were coming out, the yeah. documentaries were starting to trickle out. Yeah. So no, it was in recovery because I I moved to to back to Delaware to get clean and was in recovery with all heroin addicts and yeah. crack addicts and uh i lost maybe two friends in six years on meth yeah and all of the friends i've lost to addiction are friends from recovery who relapse on heroin and it's probably 20 20 30 people yeah, yeah. uh totally totally different culture completely yeah. Yeah. and even in portland now i have a lot of friends that work in in recovery and stuff and it's all heroin now what do you think? So you're a, you're a comic. You what I love. One of the things I always love to, about the story too is you quit comedy to pursue meth. Yeah, which makes almost more sense <laughs> than had it been the other way around. Financially, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. What and, and, and at any point in that journey, you you really are just you're you're you don't have a before that before you were doing the meth. Were you any type of addict? 
were you, was, were you, was I, I'm sure like internally, but was it manifesting itself in any way? Like you were drinking a lot, but were you, was it making a mess? Were, were, you, were you like making a mess of your life with any other substance or not? Yeah, I think I always, and I still am someone who's just so hungry for life experience that yeah. I'm always getting myself into some kind of like... Uh, mess. I remember sitting yeah. in my hotel room on the road and watching like behind the music and the story was always the same. Oh, this super talented person shit their life away on whatever. And right. I remember thinking like, mine's going to be really good. Yeah. Like, I'm <laughs> yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. really good at that part. So I thought that I had control over everything because I had a Coke phase and I quit it using alcohol. And that's what you do. <laughs> right. You yeah. Do. So you in do. my head, I was like, so I'm yeah. good. Like, yeah, that's I, what I did. You, you quit drugs through drugs. Yeah. Yeah. But there was definitely a desire to escape. Um, yeah. I was like a drunk. I was 22 years old, hanging out in an old man bar, drinking like three quarters of a bottle of Kettle One, maybe a bottle every single night. Yeah. I mean, really, really bad. And then lecturing my friends on that I stopped Coke. <laughs> like yeah. I was like literally drinking out of a, a, a glass with flies and dead things in it <laughs> with old people. In a fucking in a in a bar called Lisa's Lounge, which was named after a woman who died in a Dewey. The owner's daughter died in a DWI. Her picture was on top of the bar. And I would stand there with my warm kettle one and just get drunk and then tell my friends, like, you guys, you know, I did it. You can do it. And it's yes, like exactly. that's how fucked it is that you're you'll just go from you'll quit a drug with a drug. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And I thought that that meant that I was good, that I yeah. could do. Uh, and then I felt the same way when I went from alcohol to meth. But then when I was on meth, like that was... That was the one. Yeah, I wasn't ever a dumpster. And it was yeah. no casual. It was just pretty much like you tried it and you just went right down the road. I did it hole. every day yeah. after that. I yeah. think the longest I ever strung together was like uh, five days and I wasn't trying. Yeah. And you just couldn't get... You just, those pay phones weren't ringing. That was back in the day when you like beep somebody at a pay phone. And see if it would call back because it was yep. no cell phones. Yep. And we would stand at like train stations. You had to work waiting. so much harder. It was so hard. These kids have no idea how easy they have it. Yeah. You would so just easy stand to get at a train station and wait for this guy to call back. Yeah. We yeah. had this guy named Buckshot, but no one. And we used to. He would call back and we got Buckshot. And like apparently, like <laughs> he had gotten shot. That was a nickname. You're not supposed to. You were never supposed to say that to his face. And he's like, right. Who the fuck told you that was my name? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, can you meet up? Because I didn't know. And everyone's like, you called him Buckshot. I'm like, I didn't know. I, I heard you call him. I thought it was his name. But like, I, I mean, we had a we had a labyrinth. Of, we had a lot. And my mother started renting out rooms when I was in eighth grade to the town drug dealers, wow. to like construction people who then they were all drug dealers. That's how they were making money. They weren't phenoms at construction, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> they were. To anybody in a business, it's like they were loose. So my house became a drug house, and like eight when I was in like eighth grade. My house was the house to go to. Wow. People, which is so convenient. And <laughs> it really is. People have no idea how convenient it is. We'd be out in town, and the people would come up to me. They're like, we got to go to Madison Avenue. That's where that's where you got That's where everybody's getting. And I don't mean Madison Avenue City. I mean in Long Island. They go, that's where everybody's getting stuff tonight. And I'm like, oh, okay. And it was my house. And we'd like oh go God. to my house. I remember there was like, my mother had made cream spinach one night. And I walked in, and it was like, Every addict in my town and dealer, the acid guy, we used to say the white flower man, coke, the green flower man, the weed, everybody was sitting. And these are people that did not like each other and had had issues with each other. We're all sitting in my living room eating cream spinach. And I was just like, in eighth grade, I was like, this is kind of cool. Yeah, it's like the weirdest episode of the real world. Yeah, but I knew it was a problem, but I was still like, that seems fun. Was your mom on drugs or was no. she just had no idea she that was she was She was schizophrenic. She was born on drugs. Oh, wow. She had the good stuff already. She didn't even need to take anything. Wow. She was already there, born on home plate. You know what I mean? So she would be, you know, she'd take over the counter shit. She'd drink a lot of tab. Right. She wasn't living well, liked a grandma pizza, yeah. liked the Sicilian. <laughs> this, You know, this woman was not, she wasn't doing five miles a day, but- you know, she was never drinking and never doing, like, drug, drug, drugs. Interesting. She would do, like, a perky or something like that if the back hurt or whatever. But she was never, like, yeah, that was never she wasn't a thing. An addict, yeah. But, you know, she would just, you know, get all these people just kind of started living in the house. And me and my friend, Shay, would hang out. And, uh, you know, this woman moved in, Michelle, who was, like, you know, probably in her 30s at the time. Me and my friend Shay were 15. We just started hanging with this lady, Michelle, doing cocaine, driving around in her old Lincoln, you know? Just fun. 
Just good yeah. memories. Yeah. I mean, it what? ended horribly. No, it's, I, I, I envy because I had a totally different upbringing. I was a... Uh, you know, in Catholic school, well, you so got, you. You got to the same well, place. I got there. I mean, <laughs> I had a similar. I mean, it might be insulting to say similar, but a similar dynamic. When you said, when you described how you got, like, basically, I don't know, you call it dosed or whatever, but like, someone gave me some Adderall just to try that one night, and it was just the greatest. It was the, the rush and the, the bat. It wasn't as bad, bad of a back of the head burn as you have. But I can relate to that. That yeah. feeling. Oh, I mean, you snorted it. Uh, no, eventually I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not did do, but um. No, it's just, but it, it, it's the kind of thing you wish you never tried. Yeah. It's just like, like for me, it was never an addiction thing in a, sense, in, a in a physical sense. And I wanted to ask you, like, how that felt, with, you know, versus like, I, it probably didn't do heroin, but like, can, you know, was, was there withdrawals or was it, because with me, it just felt like he just wanted more because it just felt better. Well, with her, uh, with meth, when you're like a like a full time addict, it, once it's out of your system enough, you're going to sleep. It doesn't matter if you're on a bus. It doesn't matter if you are walking down the street. Once you hit like so many hours without it, you're just going to sleep right now, and you're going to sleep for like 17 hours involuntarily. Um, and so then, if you let like too much time pass before you re up, right. then you just have to do that nap, and then you feel like. Uh, you're being crushed down to the ground, like gravity is so heavy and stuff. But it was nothing like you don't get sick. Yeah. Um, the the come down when I got clean, clean was probably about six weeks of just you sleep so much you can't do anything else, and the nightmares. There's horrible nightmares. You ever have that like dream where you where it feels like you're falling from the ceiling? You wake up and do like yes. that. it's yeah. constant. You're just doing this. Yeah, you wake just... up and you just have that like tick, that whole body yeah. twitch. Yeah. But I mean, I've watched people kick. I had it the other night. We did a winery in Cape May, New Jersey, and I, I had this. I always have this weird. Dream where like I'm at the top of a roll or I'm at the, I'm about to fall and I start falling. Yeah. That's the dream. Yeah. I'm like I'm somewhere where I'm gonna fall and I start falling and then I wake up and like you twitch. Yeah. And I was in like a strange fucking cottage in the middle of some winery in Cape May, New Jersey, where I'm like, where the fuck am I? And I was just yeah. like, oh, this sucks. Did you get bad cotton mouth? Because that seems to be an issue with Adderall, at least. Like just like, but not just the mouth, like the whole back of your throat. Yeah. So just... I read that that's what that's what happens to your teeth. Um, oh. that that's what eats your teeth because some of the, we thought that as long as you like it just come from smoking it it gets on your teeth but it's actually that there's not enough saliva in your mouth right yeah so that's what makes your uh makes your teeth i mean my teeth fell out fast like, like, like your like teeth look great these are dentures ah, that's the move know. though i want yeah. dentures oh my god look god it's I so am, the move it's I can't recommend it enough. Oh, just, yeah. it's such a racket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just get them pulled out. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got dentures. <laughs> I was like 27. And afterwards, there were like, because I just freely pull them out and glue them in, whatever. And I yeah. talk freely about it. And I had so many people that were like, aren't you so conscious? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I just didn't have teeth right. in my 20s. Right. Yeah. I don't have body one... image issues. Right. I'm, uh, yeah. You Are got, you like, in contact with it? Because I'm not. I'm not in contact with anybody. Body from my old life. Everyone got clean. Wow, man! I'm Probably sure. sixty-five, seventy-five people. I don't. I don't. From that I, life, if they're God alive, bless you. They it, got clean. Like the last couple uh, friends. That's that were the West out. Coast for you, because I'll tell you this: ah, statistically, it's impossible how many of it's my friends amazing. Got clean. But do they? Do they? People usually. Cause I used to work in a morgue, and, and like you sort of does countless people die of heroin. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I could be wrong, but I don't remember anyone coming in from like meth. That's what I'm saying. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't lose. Uh, one guy got shot, who was like my boyfriend's friend. Yeah. Uh, there's a, you know, I heard. Meth, of... you die from your behavior. You yeah. over yeah. amp because I, yeah, I, yeah. Sh I shot up once uh, yeah. so much that I fell asleep for two days. Yeah. So you'll like over amp, but if you don't have like a pre-existing heart condition, right. it just doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't do. Hear I've that, kids? <laughs> Go on out there and have fun. How it's fine. How exceptional is it to shoot? I mean, as far as like. The most people not shoot it, or does everyone get there eventually? It really, uh, a lot of us got there. Okay. And it's one of these things where it wasn't socially acceptable. We all frowned upon it. And then once you do it, you're like, oh, everyone else is an idiot. Right. Uh, <laughs> because it's quick <laughs> it's, and it's. You're um, in it. Yeah. But I'm just like, my bot, like, I don't have veins for it. And right. So that's how it ended up in my neck. When when you were done with meth, did you, were you were like, I'm going to go back to comedy immediately? Was it a while? No, I was never going to go back to comedy yeah. because <laughs> I could never. I 
damn funny. <laughs> I could never. Well, so the first time so I started can, comedy. Quit math, but you can't, you know, no, it's like this I one, as Bill Hicks would say, the hook is deep. Yes. Yeah. I never thought I could be a comedian. I, yeah. I wanted to be an actress when I was young. Um, I like memorized Bill Cosby himself when I was eight or whatever yeah. and used to recite it for people, but I never would have thought. But I was a compulsive liar and I had lied to everyone at a at a dinner for work. And told them that I was uh, a comedian because I used to go to open mics. Oh, I so they all that. came I to su- that. they all came to support me one night. Oh. So I was like, "Oh, got to do some stand up." And then I <laughs> slammed some vodka, and I walked over to the guy because I was just like a fan that went yeah. there every week. Oh. And I walked over to the guy to sign up, and he's like, "Oh, I didn't know you were a comedian." And I was like, "Shh, shh, shh." Yeah, 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 yeah. Quietly signed up. I get up. I crush. And then when I get down, this is 98, a guy, yeah. 97, 98, a, a guy comes up and he's like, hey, we need a token female for literally said that because yeah. you didn't even have to hide the sexism back then. Yeah. Uh, we need a token female for this comedy competition. Uh, you want to come do it on token? Friday? Mm-hmm. Jesus. So I go on Friday. So this is uh, my third time on stage. I do the the um, f- uh, the contest and then I get to the semifinals and then my ninth time on stage ever I win this uh, comedy competition but I'm dr- like I'm wasted I won't get on stage so I'm wasted mm-hmm. and what I won was uh, like multiple paid work and so I was just a professional comedian wow. like a month in and then was just on the road like crazy because I had a car and mm-hmm. I was a f- slut so <laughs> just like <laughs> <laughs> All the headliners were like, you're, yeah, uh, you're can, in. Hey, can we bring Jesse Reed? They had to cover yeah, my time and shit because yeah, yeah. I had like 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my hu- that's how I, my marriage ended because that husband was like, no wife of mine after I won that uh, yeah. competition. was like, no wife of mine is going to be a comedian. I was like, uh, cool. You want the cat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so then when I get clean, I'm like, no, I'm not going back. to. I develop crippling social anxiety when right. I get clean. And then I'm like, I can't drink, so I'm never getting on stage again because I never, ever, ever, ever did a set without being drunk. We would roll into town late and get there, and it's a beer and wine bar. And I was like, well, you better hand me a pitcher with a straw because I'm not getting on that stage until I'm hammered. I love the idea of that because you're doing co- – now, this is fucking what's amazing about this story. You're doing comedy pre-social media. Yeah. How fucking awesome. God. No social media. You're out there doing it, and there's no fucking Facebook. Nope. And there's no Twitter, and there's no fucking you on Instagram being like, look at me. You're living that fucking con- like renegade life of like, that's it. Like you said, like you're like you're breezing in the town. Yep. Getting up on the stage at the beer and wine bar, staying at some fucking flea bag, whatever, motel, yep. and then fucking leaving. And it's like, and there was no, and you're doing it. That's what I love. A month in, you're doing it. Whereas right now, there are people 10 years in yeah. that are just on social media, and yeah. the, they, they've, they've seen, uh, you know, a stage here and there, very rarely. Yeah. But a month and a half in, you're like on the road doing it. Yeah. And that's what I love. And there's no like advertising it going, look at me. Right. It's just... You're in it. Yeah, that was it. So it was just road, just straight up road gigs. Yeah. And uh, shitty, bad, good. Uh, bad, good. Like all yeah. of them. I had so much fun. I was just yeah. having a blast. It yeah. was like I'm 21 be- years the old. The beginning is always the, the most fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was only doing that for about a year before I got uh, hooked on drugs. Right. So I get clean and I'm in. I'm in recovery, and I go to a convention and they have a. Uh, comedy shows at the convention mikey d from new york used to do those like the stefano yeah the best yeah and uh and i see that and i'm like oh my god this is amazing but i'm like there's no way i can do it and then i get a call from my local area and they said aren't you a comedian and i was like well i used to be a comedian they said we need an opener for the comedy show and i said yes and then immediately regretted it (laughs) did that one show and that comedian that headliner was like let me take you to do these other conventions with me. So I went around and did conventions with him and every single one of those was like, will you come back next year as our headliner? Then I went to a Mikey D show and was like, can I uh, be your feature? And he was like, yeah, if you want to sell my merch. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah, like, yeah, all right, yeah. that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, I came up here and did, I'm five months back into comedy and terrible at it. Yeah. And uh, he if, was if, doing if that. people don't know who Mike DiStefano is, the best... And I don't even want to say the term recovery comic because he was more than that. He yeah. Was Ugh, so he was much more so than good. that. But from that, and I, I, listen, I did a ton of recovery shows. That is like a genre of comedy. Yeah. It is a thing. 
And to not diminish him at all, because he was an amazing comedian all around, but I don't think there's anyone that has ever lived or will ever live that has had the insight into addiction and communicated it the way he did with comedy. Right. Like, he Absolute was the genius. best at that. He was as real as you could get. Um, and, and, and that, you know, he did that Franny's Last Ride thing at the Moth. I mean, it's like... Some of the stuff he did was like transcendent, where it's like this is more than comedy. Yeah, it's like so fucking amazing to watch. So if you don't know who Mike Distefano is, go and find that out. But go, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, I'm in. I'm in full And I didn't know he was a uh, legendary comic outside of that. Yeah, it was, it's like I still call him Mikey D because that's right. what he was in the, in the recovery. Yeah. So he had me come up here. I maybe four months. Into doing stand up, and he was um, doing, he was pitching that Comics Anonymous yeah. thing for HBO. Yeah. And I went up first at that. Like, I had no, it's at the Comedy Cellar. I had no yeah. place yeah. <laughs> being there. I just ate shit. Uh, but yeah, nicest guy in the world. But then he took me around, and then a couple other of the guys took me around. So then I was, by the next year, I was full time headlining uh, on the recovery circuit. So that's how I got back into stand up uh, accidentally yeah. again again yeah that's the root. so it is really the disease it's great yeah it's crazy did you ever you guys ever i mean it seems like lame that you would but did you ever supplement with adderall back then because i'm curious what you think of ray is so obsessed adderall. with adderall I mean, it's like, <laughs> I this is, like... you contributed so well, I... little to this <laughs> no it is am- it is amazing sometimes he's so good and then sometimes people message me and go what was he like? What is he, what he's is been wrong with talking him? about your mom's house? I can't yeah, that's it. interesting to people. You're talking about your own am, drug yeah. addiction right now. I am rebuilding to something. Do yeah, you, he, are, he he's hopelessly addicted to Adderall. Yeah, Can you I, help he him? has a I'm list. Of, hopelessly yeah. addicted. Well, he has a big problem. Well, I, no, because I, I don't usually have someone who's done a lot of meth to, yeah. to compare it to. Okay. I, I'd like to have your insight into like the fact that we're giving this to kids. Yeah, you know, on a, on a mass basis. Adderall didn't come out until after I got clean. Okay, it was Ritalin back then. Yeah. I I did uh, give all of the kids at a sleepover once my Ritalin. They all ended up in the hospital getting their stomachs pumped. <laughs> really? Now, wait a minute. Go into that. That sounds great. Uh, I was like 15 and uh, having a sleepover and was bored. And so I was like, you guys should all take these. And they got their stomachs pumped? Why? They just ate way too many of oh, okay. them, and then I one be great girl if you were just like we all wrote a novel. Yeah. <laughs> I went to bed because yeah. it doesn't have the same effect yeah, on you me. Were like, Fuck this shit! And uh, one girl just went crazy and ate everything out of the uh, medicine cabinet, including a yeah. pile of uh, iron pills. Which wow. <laughs> Just like what I kind of sleepover was this? Again. This was yeah. a real. My poor parents. This is what every yeah. sleepover ended up like. Was, this was like that's that's wild. Sneaking out and they would just lock so us. So you've out. never done Adderall? No, I don't think because I don't think it came out. No, but I think Ritalin's not that far off. So yeah, they're pretty similar. So basically, it, it doesn't compare to meth. No. Okay. But I, I have heard that Adderall does it. I guess if you take enough of it. I've right. seen people on Adderall, and I'm like, how much meth are you on right yeah. now? So I think if you snort it or take so enough So stop of it. doing Adderall would be the your advice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Or, yeah. Well, I yeah. Mean, crash my party. Sure. I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just get off it. I right? like that you have a list of talking points and they're all Adderall. <laughs> yeah, no, every every single one he chose to back into Adderall. Like, Listen, so this, you, 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 you say meth's important in Oregon. <laughs> Speaking of Adderall, <laughs> if somebody was on Adderall and, and chewing their, their, the inside of their mouth a lot at their job and it made the girl next to them uncomfortable, what would what would you do? What would you say? What would you? Say? I mean, it's like it's really, you know, yeah. I mean, stop doing Adderall. One thing I love about you too is it like. You get some messages from some real Man. dirt bags on Facebook. Yeah. And all these I love uh, it. And you get some real and you expose and this is one of the funniest things ever. You put up all of these messages you get from these like dirt bag are they comedy promoter? Who are these people? They're like some of them are like weirdly connected to comedy, like a comedy adjacent or yeah. something. Or some of them aren't. Like some of them are just guys that have seen you at a show and they write like horrible stuff to you and you just put it up and tag them you tag them (laughs) it's amazing you tag them I you can't believe how guys think that they have, uh, <laughs> they like that I owe them anonymous. Like, 
I didn't. You can't just unsolicited send me like I bet you suck a mean dick and then be like, whoa, 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 why are you showing everyone what I said? It's like, are you kidding me? Because this is gold. Yeah, and they, I, um, they do say that, which yeah. is like crazy. In 2014, I was like, I have to, I have to, I was living in Delaware, and so right. I was thinking, okay, like, how can I build a career from Delaware? And I was like, I'll start on Facebook. So I just accepted a shit ton of friend requests and just spent time being funny on Facebook since yeah. I lived in Delaware. And when I accepted these friend requests, I got a ton of just creeps who would just go from zero to crazy <laughs> in my inbox, which had been happening to women since the beginning of Facebook. Right. But I, uh, I, this is the first one the, the guys would do like the, Hey, 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 a uh, fuck you, bitch. You fucking like, oh, yeah. just, like crazy <laughs> on you. Yeah, yeah. And so then I started kind of bantering with them a little bit. And then when they wouldn't stop, I would just screenshot it and then tag them in the posts and get, uh, one guy said, Jessa is stinky, punky shit. Uh, uh, one guy was a Bollywood actor who had to delete his Facebook wow. afterwards Yeah, uh, because he got exposed. And then they would just turn – the threads would be gold because everyone yeah. would just show up and yeah. just toss this guy wherever. Right. And then I couldn't believe – I was it was happening so often that I, I – start, I couldn't believe how many people – you only had to like scroll down a little bit on my page to realize – what your destiny was if you went there with me, right. but like guys were still doing it, and then I th it stopped happening. So I thought maybe I aged out. Right, but uh, now right. it's back. It's so creepy. That is one thing. As a dude, you really don't have to deal with that. Like I've never had that happen. You've I've had, had some problems with it. You've you've had some people. people. No, of course not. Who's no. <laughs> <laughs> no, hold on. My podcast partner. Yeah. Uh, so he's just this sweet. Uh, Mormon. Mormon kid. He's not Mormon anymore, but he still just has this kind of sweet energy Innocence. about him. I have yeah. never seen a man get so sexually harassed wow. and have his autonomy not... By women. Yeah. Wow. And so he like uh, recently did a show, and I guess at the end, just he didn't have a hotel, so he just said something like, is there somewhere I could stay or something? And it turned into like so many messages about, I really felt like we had a connection, the way you were looking at me from the stage. And then one chick was just like, hey, do you want to come stay at my house? And he's like, I already left town. And she's like, okay, well, you should come back. And he's like, no, it's all right. And then she just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, tit pick, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, uh, another tit pick. And then he just like, he sent me a screenshot. There's five million messages. And then she says, you can tell me to fuck off if you'd like. And he goes, yeah, if you could. I mean, you're freaking me out. Yeah. And then just full vagina yeah. spread open. Wow. Here is my cervix picture wow. and then he's like what the fuck and then another one and then he had to block her and i was like dude i've never ever heard of a dude have that happen so i should become a mormon yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 what uh where does he live is he in la too he's in salt lake city he'll be in la soon so we have to like meet in vegas to record podcasts oh that's funny so you meet in vegas to record the pod i love the idea of that ex meth head ex mormon yep. L.A., Salt Lake City, meet in Vegas yeah, to record, to record podcast. our podcast. Or like we, we, we do shows together. So right. uh, if we're on tour, then we'll just record. We stay up all night and record a bunch. Um, but if we have to. That's we, so fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty I mean, that's sweet. That's great. Where, where can people find it? Uh, just mormoninthemethhead.com, yeah. and then it's everywhere. It's yeah, iTunes and absolutely. everything else. What do you. This week, uh, yeah. I, he hadn't done acid yet. So we went to Sedona, Arizona. On our way across the country, and I babysat his first acid trip. How was that? Fantastic! Really? Oh, so fun! Oh, that's so funny! So fun! What did what 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 was he like? Freaked out? Was it? No, we were like um, so. Sedona has these vortexes or whatever, where they're like energy vortexes, yeah. which already feel cool without yeah. drugs, even in like all the trees. Circles? No, the trees. Have you heard of these before? That there's just like a it's some uh, electromagnetic. Whatever, no. I'm not science, but I mean, it's yeah. like the trees grow in, uh, they're like twisted up. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it feels, it felt really cool and magic. Yeah. And then there's just all these, these like mountains or whatever, but they're all just this, uh, really pretty rocks and stuff. Yeah, I know it's yeah. beautiful. Is, is uh, that where they have red? No, that's Colorado is red rocks. Right? Yeah. See how the trees are all twisted. Oh, interesting. They just naturally, everything's twisted like that out there. It's really, 
Um, but so see how beautiful the, the rocks yeah, are. Yeah, I want I want to go out there. Yeah, it was gorgeous. Yeah. So uh, we're out there and just stayed out there through the sunset, and then as we're walking back down. Uh, he calls a lift, but forgets he calls a lift. <laughs> and then uh, the lift driver is driving up and down the mountain trying oh to find God. us. And then he looks down at his phone and realizes that he's called a lift. And we have to jump into a gutter because he thinks the lift driver is going to try to talk to us. And it's like I've done so many psychedelics that yeah. I know how hilarious this is. My first time acid was eighth grade. And my we were at my friend's uh, Tina's house. And we did acid. And her mother walked in. And, and, and she and her friends had left. And we just wanted to stay in the house me and my other friend wanted to stay in the house she wanted to go out and explore nature we said we were just such like fat fucks we we're just like we'll just stay here like we don't yeah you know, we were like smoking weed we we're like you know we we're in that room with like the you know the black light and the hendrix yeah. poster we're yeah. like we don't we don't need to so my friend's mother came in tony who was she's a legend and tony came in and just started like doing this funky chicken dance <laughs> And it mesmerized both of us. And she just looked at us. She's like, and now you'll never know if I really did that or not. And just oh, walked Oh, my God. Out. That's excellent. She's fucking great. She oh. was a fucking amazing human being. Amazing I did human being. acid trip and just sat in a basement dry firing a sawed off shotgun when yeah. I was 15. <laughs> yeah. And then went into this whole like... Is this a real shot? Like, yeah. how am I not allowed to walk down the street with this? Right. This is just an object in yeah. this world, this reality that we lived in. And tried to go take the sawed-off shotgun down the street for right. a walk. Yeah. Uh, just to prove that it's just an object. I can't get in trouble for an yeah. object. You know, right. thank God they didn't let me. <laughs> um, really weird. Well, because then when I talked to him about it, he was like, well, so I was Googling. And I'm like, uh, he's 31. And I'm just, I can't imagine the, like, he has put prep into his first acid trip oh, like he's wow. researching it ahead of time like so many things that i was just doing at 15 yeah me too like the idea of google or anything i was just like well i'm just putting a piece of paper in my mouth yeah the, my google was asking my friend deanna what happened to her <laughs> when she did it last week exactly you know deanna what happened she's like well you know you take it you know trails you start to see tra and it's like okay and that was google yeah that was it. Yeah. You know, but now these people are like, it is a different culture with drugs now. Exactly. Because kids are like, people are like, I, I hate, I don't want to use the word responsible because it's not the right word, but like, they're, they are more efficient. Yeah. They know the strains they know and the, the effects they it's going like, to have on they're them. They're like, I'm micro dosing to like expand my consciousness. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Oh, I'm hanging out in a crack house with someone named Rosie. You know what I mean? Because it's fun. What happened to having fun? Like these kids are like fucking still trying to. They're, they're going to. They're still trying to go to Brown, and it's like, yeah, they, oh. it's amazing. They fit the drugs in, but it was like that late '90s culture was just like fucking an early millennium. It was just like that that idea of like, oh yeah, I'm a dirt bag. Yeah, that's what the thing is. Like I'm a dirt bag. Like. Now, people are doing drugs, and they're like, and obviously back then there were people that were high-class drug addicts. I'm not yeah. saying that they weren't. But, like, now it's like people are like, they're like, yep, I smoke at this cafe. Like, I have no issue. I smoke yeah. with my mom. I do, you know what I mean? And I was like, I was leaving teen night with Deanna. Exactly. To get fucking high behind a food town. Yeah. We were, Different world. We were smoking weed to a dented soda can. Yes. And now they're yes. like, no, oh, I don't like sativas. They no. make me anxious. Yeah, it's, it's like, like a whole what? different world. They're like millionaires There's no in danger. Colorado. Yeah, There's no danger. I mean, it's just... It's very sad. That's everything about their life. I mean, the world's never been more dangerous, but they all want to live in this kind of boutique kind of experience kind of situation where it's like, I'm going to, you know, know exactly what I'm going to get into and fucking, yeah. you know, I'm going to like, you know, pre-plan it and then Instagram it and then fucking document it. It's just, no one just lives anymore. Such a different world. It is such a different world. And hey, good for them, whatever. I mean, it's like one of the, I don't want to be one of those guys who's like, well, in my day. But it's like, I am glad that I grew up in a time when you could get lost. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I do like that. I do love not getting lost. I mean, I still manage to do it, but yeah. I love uh, I love being right at that age where I, I fully experience the analog world, but yeah. I'm not lost in the digital world. Right. I, I, I like that. the idea of, like, I'm on too much social media now, I think. Like, yeah. because of the job, I'm, like, too much. I'm too plugged in. The most amazing things I do are when I take a walk and I don't take out my phone. Yeah. With a friend or something or by myself. Like, that is still one of the things, because that's all I did. Yeah. That's all we used to do is just go and smoke weed and go for a walk or go for a drive or fucking that's all we did. Yeah. And there was something cool about that. And then you got your phone and now you fucking don't do anything without your phone. 
Yeah. You know? So it's like interesting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, sure. I think I had a healthier upbringing. Now, but yeah, was it in a crack house? Sure. Yeah. But <laughs> Did it, you have guns pulled on you? Yeah. What, what, what are they going to do? They have them, you know. Um, <laughs> they, they want your money. They want to take it from you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, they, but there was something about, I mean, there was something about that, that, uh, but there's also something about being sober that I, I like now and being able to go like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm like done. I'm yeah. too old and like how long have you been sober um i've been sober about seven years okay. six and a half seven years and i'm like the idea is like i'm like i look at everybody and i look at people at bars getting drunk and it's like none of it looks good yeah none of it looks fun none of it seems interesting no it's all kind of just like oh i'm good like yeah. i'm done it's so nice to like uh with alcohol especially because i only drank that little bit of time before yeah math and then, you know, with meth, I was looking for uh, an escape from the mundane. And yeah. I feel like I found that philosophically right. during my time on meth so that when I when I got clean, it was like, OK, but like I see that the world is bigger than what everyone else thinks it is. So that's fine. Yeah. Right. Um, but then with alcohol, it's I watch what a crutch ha- for people who aren't alcoholics just how difficult socializing is for them, how they have to weave it into everything, and then how everyone just disconnects and everything gets weird. And like, I, I comics are fun to be around when they drink because they're still usually sharp enough that it's that yeah. it's all right. But like the the um, oh my god, I love you. People like on the <laughs> second they get three yeah. glasses of wine in, I'm like I'm gonna leave now. But I'm so grateful that I'm just engaged in life and that yeah. I don't have to try to figure out how to navigate it without that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it's already not a part of it. And I'm glad that I don't have the desire to do it. And I'm just glad that I like, it ran its course quick and hard. And I have all these cool experiences from it. And, uh, and then I get to be sober. Why did Ukrainians try to kill you? I can't talk about that yet. Okay. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. That's fair. I know. I, like, I gloss over it. Uh, I I gloss over it. I had to ask. (laughs) Because I had this like near death experience, and I gloss over the. Yeah. And I usually end up on podcast telling the near death experience story because it's wild. When I was hearing your thing too, I was thinking like, "Where's the book?" Yeah, it's got to be a book. It's got to be. Uh, there's there's gotta also be a like book. a ton of stories that I need. Uh, I want a book, and I want you on the cover in that FBI windbreaker. <laughs> yeah. The fucking, yeah. God, I can't believe yeah. there's no pic because like police raids and stuff. So right. I lost all you the know, what? and I got to be honest with you, I there's no picture of me doing anything. Like no, no one took pictures. That's what people don't understand. Nobody had a fucking camera. Well, I had to, we had a bunch of pictures. I do have a picture. Yeah. Of, well, there is a whole thing of me. Uh, a whole album on Facebook called "This Is Your This Is Your Jessa on Meth" or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, and it's uh, pretty pretty wild. But I had braids through the whole thing. Okay. And um, uh, there is a picture that I didn't put up where my arm is just tied off because I would have to tie my arm off and then <laughs> wait for it to almost die for a vein to be big oh, enough yeah. to hit. Um, but uh, but a ton of stuff like I lost almost everything, just police raids and stuff like, you know, there were like oh, identity, okay. identity thieves and stuff. Yeah. And I was just kind of like a floater. And so I just would carry all my stuff and then it would get yeah. taken by the cops. And because I, I have a few photos of me, but I do not have a ton. Like, I don't have a ton. Yeah. Like, nobody was like you weren't like hanging out in fucking a house where people cutting up an ounce of cocaine, like taking snapshots. Yeah, exactly. Who That's another big that? thing. Yeah. Is yeah. That, I was a photographer it, back then. I used to take pictures of myself getting high. I don't yeah. want some. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, I've why are you looking at me like that? Well, you're getting high. Adderall. Adderall. Listen, <laughs> quite, listen, if I take two Adderall every day, is it a problem? Speaking of Adderall, no. Uh, do you want to stop doing it? I stopped. Okay. I don't do it anymore. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, I was convincing. What? I, I do it occasionally. It's not some fucking thing that I do all the time. Okay. I was just—it's an interesting dichotomy. Whatever. Point is. Uh, no, you were bringing up the conspiracies before. How deep into the that rabbit hole did you get while you? Yeah, were I heard you guys talking about conspiracies, yeah. and I, I wanted, have you talked about whether or not reality is a is a video is a video game or a, <laughs> a computer generate uh, simulation? simulation? We never did that. It was we we never got the. There was a couple of guys from like there's this guy Nick Bostrom from Oxford who's like a big proponent of that, and then the other guy who's like is Elon Musk, and like they will never come on the show. Right. So we don't have. There's no expert in it, but I've always found that interesting. The idea yeah. of that. But I've never, like, we're not in base reality. We're in a simulation. But I've yeah. never had an expert come yeah. on. I had a, when I had the near-death experience, I just went inside of this, I was just in this blue ball. It's a really long story, about yeah. the, the short version. I was just in this blue ball of light. Yeah. And I was in it, 
but I was like my own person, so I didn't have a body. And it said you you learned what you went there to learn. You can stay if you want, um, or you can go back. And like it was a choice. Crazy. And then for the whole rest of my meth addiction, I was in uh, like in my at night when, or whenever I would sleep, I was in this like al- like the school. I called them the aliens. Uh, but I was kind of being funny, but they were kind of aliens where they just like taught me a bunch of stuff. And according to the, it's probably schizophrenia from the drugs, but, uh, according to them, it was like a video. It was basically like a, what we would call now, like a virtual reality video game. That reality was just, so then when people started saying this computer simulation thing, it was like, well, that was kind of what the implication was was that yeah like, i never had an issue with it. i never knew i was also never convinced i was never i i was i was never like ah fuck that but i was never like that's the thing i was always just kind of like yeah maybe so you weren't like ranting about the oklahoma city bombing you were more into like the ethereal. there was like uh well so like the reptilian agenda <laughs> yeah before now you're talking our before language. this Come uh on in. before what's his name yeah, yeah. so well because the in the in the in the dream school that i was going to yeah. while on meth they said Okay, so like, uh, like Earth's a stage that you come to play the video game, right? Yeah. And uh, and everything that happens to you, you have chosen to experience. And uh, people that do things to you, that's a deal that you guys have together. And that we are currently, or we're playing a game where you don't remember that you're playing a game. And sometimes there's games where we do remember. And uh, the reptilian, uh, rather than being cold-blooded, which is why I think they call them reptilians... They describe them as like parasites. So they are in the game, but they cannot create things like we, the play. This could be schizophrenia. I just want no, that. No, no, no. Go. Um, this is great. I don't care we, what it is. This is great. <laughs> so they can't create reality like we can create reality. So the only way to get their reality created is to control the minds of the sleeping people who can create. So all of the we are the 1%, we get richer while you get poorer. Yeah. Like they get people who are actually creating reality to keep creating that for them. Basically by complaining. Interesting. And so that they... Um, this is great. So that they live on this planet. That, they but they're like that negative energy. Yes, they are and, parasites. And their, their position in society is kind of reinforced by the getting people... To get angry with them and yep. to be upset and fear. to feel just pumping and fear. fear. So in history, they create they they controlled them with religion. Yeah, and just enough in the because people have the sensation that this isn't real. They have the sensation that there's something bigger. So then they would feed them just enough to to validate that sensation inside of them that there's more to life, and then use it. Then add all these rules and all this shame and like oh if you jerk off your whore these things that are like natural that you're built to do right and then control the masses then as people start to wake up out of religion then they're like it's this and it's creating chaos and fear and turning everybody against each other meanwhile you're just feeding the parasites now in hindsight do does that trace back to stuff you read or is this all like insights that just purely came out of the mouth there was uh so i would just be by the way at this point in the episode everyone's doing math (laughs) everyone in our audience right now is like uh uh if that's where you go to i'm going to the alien school Uh, I came back from the near-death experience just knowing a bunch of stuff. I also, yeah. Yeah. I also could just hear people's true motives. Yeah. And this is something that's just kind of shifted in the collective consciousness. But you know how now you can just hear when people are lying? Like, you can hear the subtext in yeah. what people are saying? It didn't used to be like that. Right. And so, uh, but like back, this is like 2000, that happened where I just, when I woke up, I just could hear what people really meant. I could hear their true motives. Yeah. I could hear like the trauma that motivated them or the fear that motivated them. And then I got taught a bunch of stuff that I never got to use. Like they told me how to move things with my eyes and, and according to them, we were going to shift into a different game where everyone remembers who they are. And we we get to like more dimensions. Do you, so we get to do more stuff. You kind of joked about it before, but you something about like how the CIA. Tra- do you re- feel like possibly you were ever like a? So I didn't have teeth, so I never messed with this. But all my friends, uh, when identity theft came out, the dudes that showed up mm. with the DMV files. I'm just waiting for this to catch up with me. Saying <laughs> this on podcast, the dudes that showed up with the DMV files 
and the Photoshop and the Photoshop and the templates and stuff didn't seem like meth addicts to me. And I remember just sitting back being like, don't you guys think it's kind of weird? And that's back when we believed that if you asked someone if they're a cop, they would have to tell you. Not right. that CIA was ever, right, right. That, not that that was ever real, but they were never beholden to yeah. it. And so they were just kind of in and out, and then but they had just taught all kinds of and then everyone just, just got away it. with it like they they came into your i guess your circle of friends yeah. but like what were they doing they were just kind of showing you how to do yeah stuff just not... showing everyone a hustle which is wasn't crazy were they also doing meth and that was the other like, thing was the like release. yeah they would like uh pass the pipe after taking a tiny hit they never seemed like jonesy and then the couple that did do it got turned inside out which seemed like oh you're you haven't been doing meth long enough to hold your shit together right. So that was just and there they, were and there's nothing like practical they could have gotten off of you like but like they were they, they were just, they weren't like yeah so typically if someone right comes now. in and teaches a group of tweakers a, a hustle they're trying to get meth out of it or yeah, there yeah. was like yeah yeah and the, it, there wasn't but you know they were all kind of also and I can't even like picture these dudes. Uh, clearly in my head i just remember being like don't you guys think this is weird and then as time went on and then then uh from the perspective of keeping everyone asleep at the time i thought it was to put chips in people because identity theft took off so fast and screwed so many people over that i was like oh if you wanted to put a chip in people you couldn't be like hey we're going to put a chip in you but you could let all of their identities get stolen mm -hmm. and wait until they're like isn't there like a way you could like put it inside of us so no one can steal it and so that just yeah. seemed like the perfect plan and there well, was a company i think, I think what's going to happen now i mean that's going to happen with health yeah. issues now yeah well there was a company yeah. called uh Vera Vera sign or Vera Vera chip. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and they had already done something called Digital Angel where they had chipped all of uh, a bunch of um, inmates. And so Vera chip was then went and bought all of the and this is in 2000, 2000 2001. Right around 9-11. They bought all of the retail software. So you still see that where you swipe your card, it says VeriSign. Yeah. That company yeah. originally, and it's on Wikipedia, that company originally uh, was had the patent on the chips they were going to put in people's hands. So it all seemed very clear to me how it was going to play out. And then obviously there was something about the chips that would control your mind or something, I thought. Yeah. like So it all seemed very clear, and then it just fizzled, and nothing happened, except for they still own that software, and it now is looking like... Medical records is going to be the way to get people to get it. Yeah, it'll be like, oh, you're incapacitated. You can't give us information about your medical history, right. but we can find it if we have this chip. Yeah, that... and there's no less efficient system in the world than medical records. Right. It is right. so ridiculous yeah. how none of them communicate with each other. So it's interesting. So you had people that came in to just show you how to steal identities. Yep. That's interesting. Just, and they didn't want any money, didn't want to cut. Yeah, and it wasn't like, hey, we're going to teach you how to steal identities. It was like everyone was some type you of You wonder criminal. if they were like running an algorithm trying to see what, if you guys could do it or if you could be taught or how easy it was. Because there's, there's just all throughout history, you know, with, with, with uh, the CIA and people like that, they do these weird experiments. They take yeah. people and they just fucking have these experiments, you know, MK Ultra. They, they're like, what do drugs do? What are they, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so sometimes it's just, it's interesting. Was it in Portland at the time? It was in Portland, and then I lived in a house that had three apartments, and there was a shit ton of us there, and they never raided that house. And I remember sitting out on the roof one day, and a fake bum came up and was digging through our trash can. And he was like, uh, dude dressed in, in good clothes, uh, rough shoes, and who had clearly just smeared dirt on himself. And I remember being like, you're not even trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of my garbage. And now yeah. you say it wasn't raided, but like most of the other places you were staying throughout these years. If like I would like end up at other places, but this house was like, there was so much shit happening at this house. I, t I tell one story where I had like a rule because I was in charge of the house. I had a rule where you can't cook meth in the house because I don't want to blow up. And I remember they snuck and were cooking meth anyway. And I came home and one of them was burning an incense in the mailbox Jeez. like that was yeah. you're burning an incense on the outside of the house nothing <laughs> nothing weird happening here <laughs> uh that reptilian yeah. stuff is very interesting to me it's yeah. very interesting because like i almost wonder in in, in and I, this might not be something you know you know do the reptilians know they are reptilians or is it just they are just pre like they just do these things. They have these. They behave in this way. Are they cognizant of it, or are they just kind of doing it? That is an interesting question. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, yeah. you know, you saw the, the thing you where, wonder where like, Louis C.K. Yeah. asked Rumsfeld if he's a reptilian yeah, yeah, and he yeah, doesn't so answer, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm... Um, so... Because I almost wonder if, like, there is some, you know, to get really out there now, yeah. why not? I almost wonder if there is a hard wiring with certain groups of people. Well, it could just be sociopaths. Well, they, well, well that's what I mean, though. So yeah. let's, let's, ex- let's take sociopath now and... You know, go go into that in terms of like, you know, if you have an entire class of people that are sociopaths and they control an enormous amount of wealth, an enormous amount of political power, you wonder if that's just kind of in their hard wiring to behave and operate a certain way and, and uh, where that comes from. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, you know? so let's say it is a video game and we are asleep. Yeah. And that we're all starting to wake up. Right. Right. And so uh, the whole game changes. And then when you have a a planet full of people playing a video game who know that they're playing a video game and your entire life uh, can only exist if these people stay asleep. Yeah. But that is interesting to think uh, that does their avatar know that they are or do they have avatars or are they... uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't tend to, we we don't tend to go into that school of you know actual them being actual reptiles or being aliens, right? But they are like the rich and the powerful who do control this world definitely see everything a different way than us, right? They think in different terms than us. They have a different kind of, and they use people differently than we you know use people, right? So yeah, their emotions and the way that they control them, right? And the way that they, I mean, it is the different. way that they age and the way their faces look when they age. Yeah. Um, the thing that has made me start, I used to think that video games and computer simulations were the best metaphor for consciousness. I spent a lot of time thinking about the nature of consciousness, um, and I've only recently started to think the more technologically advanced we get, the more I'm like, but. So you know how like you Google something and the next thing you know it's on your sponsored ads on yeah, Facebook yeah, yeah. or whatever? But like reality is kind of like that. You think about someone you haven't talked to a long time and they show up or you harshly judge someone else's life experience and then you it becomes a life experience that you yeah. experience. Yeah. Like I just see all of these uh, – I don't know. I just I've, – I've spent a lot of time recently being like wouldn't that be funny if it was literally a computer simulation? I mean that would be kind of a bummer but also kind of cool. Yeah. Fun if you could find out. If you could find out before everyone else finds out and then just play the game when everyone else I mean, I think that's the way you describe that's the way you'd have to describe comedy, math. <laughs> yeah. Like kind of a bummer, <laughs> but kind of cool. You know what I mean? Like that I think is just across the board. Jesse Reed, where can people find you if they want to find you and they should find you? They should because find you. you have some fascinating shit to say and just that ten minutes on that <laughs> is just like, Oh God, I would listen yeah. to that all day. Yeah. Tell people where they could get your podcast and everything. Uh, podcast is Mormon in the Meth Head, uh, dot com. I do go do a whole episode soon on the uh, on the near death experience and the alien stuff. And then social media, I prefer Facebook. Yeah, me too. Over everything else. So just Jessa Reed. I know we're old school. On Facebook. Yeah, it's so much better. Twitter's like, what are we doing? God, I don't want to yeah. have to cut down to like. I guess yeah. now there's not a limit anymore, but I didn't. Yeah. I I quit Twitter a long. T- I mean, yeah, I'm Twitter on it. Twitter sucks, but I hate it. I'm a big presence on Snapchat. Yeah, right. <laughs> the kids love them. <laughs> um, Adderall. <laughs> so now you're 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 here. You're doing some showcases. You're at Helium this weekend. Yeah, Helium Philly this weekend. Awesome. Very cool. And, so uh, if you're listening live, which you should be, you should subscribe seven dollars a month. You get all the shows. And you get the opportunity to hear this live and go to Philly, or if you live there, get get in there and see Jessa Reed this weekend. And then are you doing anything else in New York, or are you heading back west? Uh, heading back. I'm um, hanging out with my family for the next okay. couple of weeks, and then heading back to L.A. Do you have a, do you have a website if people want to see, see you live? Yes, JessaReed.com. JessaReed.com will get you her live dates, but yeah, listen to... I will totally update that soon. <laughs> yeah, Mormon in the meth head. And you can follow her on Facebook, too. She'll, I'm sure you put up your live dates yeah, there. Yeah, that's where I do most of everything. All that. And Instagram, you have an Instagram? Mm-hmm. Okay. Where? Jessa Reed? Uh, Jessa Reed Comedy on Instagram Jess, and Twitter. Jessa Reed Comedy. I kind of like and Instagram Snapchat. now, too, because it's like simple. Like, yep. boom, boom. Here's where I'm going to be. Enjoy it. It is what it is. Uh Ray Kump, where can people find you? You can find me on uh, Instagram or uh, Twitter at Ray Kump. Uh, yeah. You can find uh, my Vice Sports show, That Happened, on Vice Sports Facebook. Yeah. Got new episodes coming out early April. So and next week we're going to go into, you had an interesting set at the winery. Yeah. No, it, it was a dark, uh, took a dark turn. Yeah. I, uh, I went after the crowd a bit. Yeah. And uh, I tried to, like, 
shake them into submission didn't work. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah, it was wild. I almost wonder, Shannon, can we? If I, I have uh, the videos on my phone. How could we play them effectively? Uh, from an Instagram story for, yeah. for next week, you mean? Oh uh, well, from for now, we could we could tease it now. Like, is there a way to? Because I have them on my phone. I mean, I'd need I'd need a few minutes off I mean, to just, set them for up. now. If you just want to tease, you can play, you know, put the mic up to the phone. Yeah, let me just. We'll just tease. We'll just tease. Um, this is this is when it starts to turn, uh, which is he he starts with a heroin riff, which is kind of funny. Where he's like, you know, heroin's bad, but I don't see anyone else making friends in their thirties, you know, which is kind of funny. Yeah. And then uh, someone's kid in the crowd had died of heroin. It seems so, that way. Oh. Yeah. It, it seemed that way. So Ray, and then so this is then what it what it then happened rather quickly. He starts talking about moving on. He gets very angry. <laughs> So that's just the, the time when it really starts to turn. This is when, by the way, he's just kind of having a breakdown, uh, and he's reminding them why, why things aren't going well, and he's instructing them. <laughs> This is, this is the this is the the, the final, and we're gonna we're gonna play this long form next week. But this is the final. <laughs> He's booed off stage. I very few people have I seen full boo. Wow. Well, if, it was, if I wasn't, I didn't want to like ruin the momentum for the rest of the show. I th Otherwise, I would have fought them harder. I wouldn't yeah. have let them boo me off stage. That was not ruining the momentum for the rest of the show? I'm saying I would have, you could still, it still went fine after that. But I would have, if it was just like a showcase show, I would have stood my ground. And I would have just, It know. has become a thing. I have a heroin joke. And yeah. it used to just crush yeah. immediately. And I have to like halfway through bring them back now because yeah. everyone has been hurt by heroin. Right. So. It's been out there, folks. Uh, TimDillonComedy.com for dates. I will be at Magoobies this weekend in Baltimore if you're listening live. Uh, I'll be at Moon Tower in uh, Austin in April. Uh, also, I will be over this summer in Chicago, at Zanies, Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, Comedy Connection, Providence, Rhode Island. If you're in any of those cities, please start to grab your tickets so you're committed to coming. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. New dates added. I'll be in Ireland at the Vodafone Festival if we have any fans in Ireland. Going back to the mother country. And uh, Netflix will be out. Hopefully this summer we'll see what happens. Uh, when, we don't know. We'll let you know. We'll announce that. Sign up for the bus tour show, TimDillonComedy.com. We'll email you for tickets. Um, and a couple of big announcements that are going to come. Can't really talk about them yet, but some cool things that are going to happen. Um, me and Ari Shafir went to go see Jordan Peterson. We went backstage. We'll talk about that next time. We'll talk about your epic, epic set. Thank you. At the Kate May Winery. And uh, the great Jessa Reed. Find her on everything. Follow her. She's the best. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having Thank me. You. All right, later. So what's interesting now is you, you were kind of touching on the whole idea that, like, you know, you mentioned the secret or, you know, whatever. And, 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 and obviously the secret, there's a lot of bullshit there. Right. Obviously. Yeah. You know, because people are like, hey. You know, I think Dave Chappelle made the point. They're like, what do you think? People in Africa aren't thinking about food. Right. You know, they're exactly. not trying to manifest food. But there is this thing now where it's like people really don't want to hear that they have any culpability with the reality that they're living in. Exactly. Like, and, and the idea is that, and it's very hard, and you touched on this when you were talking about like energy and, and what you manifest in the world and what you, you bring out there. If you start your day with Twitter, you're feeding yourself this toxic diet. Right. That you then go manifest, you know, right. and and whether it's social media or whether it is, and you had made an interesting point about like being in a work environment. I think the two examples that are that everyone has experienced is either a relationship that you have allowed to get to the point where you are 
uh, this, the, my partner keeps doing something I don't like. And if you're really, truly honest with yourself, you're excited when you get another opportunity to have something to be mad about right. once it has gone toxic like that. Right. And then like, I have had jobs where we just got in the habit of complaining about whatever changes the management made. And then it was like, we were, it, there was, we became addicted to the experience of the outrage and the, and the, the victimhood of it. And it, it just like, it becomes the the whole i don't know that it's like you're manifesting it in the universe but it's you're attracting that experience because you are actually enjoying if you're truly truly honest with yourself uh i i was enjoying when my boyfriend would do something for right, me to be right. mad at i was enjoying when the bosses would make a change and it wasn't until after i got separated from it a little bit that i'm like none of these changes ever ended up mattering but I loved being outraged and I loved being a victim of how this is going to screw us out of yeah. money or whatever. And on a large scale, you see this uh, in a lot of people's lives. And, uh, and they, it's tough to bring it up now because there are actual victims. Right. So when you exactly. have actual victims that are actually victims of oppressive structures out there that, that make it very hard for them to live a, a good life. Yes. And you have actual victims... But even those people, even people that have actually had a really rough road in life, aren't helped by dwelling in this negative space. Like, they're exactly. not helped. I've met people that have been molested, abused, um, people that have, uh, you know, had diseases, people that have gone through all kinds of crazy things, people that were falsely accused of crimes, people who have done time in jail that shouldn't have. And, and all of them, what's funny is some of the people that I've met who have gone through the worst things in life are the most positive people. Yes. And that's fascinating. The idea I that they've that. seen the darkest things you could see, and now they are the most positive because they, they realized somewhere along the way that they had the power within themselves to do something and to put themselves on like a different frequency yeah. than everybody else. And that's the thing with Trump where it's like, you know, Trump is kind of objectively not doing a good job, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, that's kind of ob objective reality. But the obsession with him, especially from a lot of people in our business who are literally making money off him in the sense that, like, he has made them now relevant. There are people yeah. in our business whose entire who have shows based on this guy. There is something interesting about you hate him, you hate him, you hate him. You have a TV show about him. Yeah. There's something weird about paying that. a ton of attention to something that you don't like. Yeah. So here's my not a popular take on Trump that I usually that I've never that I just well, this is the myself. place for it. Yeah. We needed this. Right. Because we have been stuck in this corrupt ass having this corrupt government that gets away with everything because it's all 100% bullshit all the time, all spin, all bullshit. And if we didn't get someone to be so, we didn't get a president that is so over the top, it's going to be, once he's gone, it's going to be completely different. Yeah. There has been a light shined on everything as a result of this clown car in the government. And so, like, now we'll get to have a candid president, like a more honest, yeah. open thing. Now we're like, now you got, and the youth is complete. When I was, we didn't know anything. I didn't know the difference between the House and the Senate. God, weren't the 90s great, Yeah, baby. I mean, but yeah, these. Who cared? These millennials, they're so involved, and they understand how their government works. And so there's a ton of positives coming yeah. out of this but like definitely no like uh uh losing sleep over you know this isn't permanent this isn't right. a permanent state of being right. and definitely not that people don't have horrible life experience but there is well this is what happened right before i died was i had a realization and that was that nothing outside of me good or bad could affect me uh any way that I didn't decide to let it affect me, that it was a decision that experiences I can't control, but I do get to decide how I perceive those experiences. And when you really run like all of your trauma and all of your life experience at the time, like I had been, I was abused as a child. I was molested for years. The people, when I tried to tell that I was molested, yeah. let me down. Right. Like, you know, I was, I was raised in a drug house. Like there yeah. was, I went to, was, my parents took me to a lot of theme restaurants. So I get, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? It was kind of like the staff had pins on. 
on, it's like this is odd. So like, <laughs> yeah, right, same exact. Right, yeah, okay. so you you feel me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I um I ran all of my trauma and all of my pain and all of these things that I held so tightly to. I ran them through this idea and was like, that is a decision. And there are people that I've met who have been through so much worse than me who do have a different outlook on it. And I realized, like in that moment, like this is I get to decide, and I get to decide whether or not I pay attention to things that I don't like. And so my my basic philosophy on things is like when when something happens that I don't like, I don't give it a bunch of power. I say like, can I change this? And yeah. this is like the accept the things I cannot change. You had a great quote too. What was that quote you said about what what about the reality and what it is? Uh, oh, that I had read in a book. Uh, reality is none other than an audiovisual demonstration of where your attention is. Your attention, um, the universe assumes that your attention is on that which you desire and gladly provides you with more of the same. So the idea is, is that you're only experiencing what you're paying attention to. And that like, so it's like a waiter coming up to your table and just brings you whatever you order and you order by paying attention. So if all you're talking about is things you don't like, you just experience more of that. And even if it's not the galaxy dropping things off, woo woo, whatever bullshit, reality is perception based. So if all you're looking for is things that resonate with this idea that everyone's out to get you or that you can't get ahead or that your boyfriend is garbage or that the president is ruining everything or that your boss is an asshole, that's all you're going to experience because that's the lens through which you're seeing reality. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting because people are really resistant to that concept now. Yeah. And when you try to put that concept out, out there, even in a very, you know, friendly uh, way, where you kind of suggest that you do have agency over yeah. your thoughts, your idea, like the way that you live. People tend to get very defensive. Yeah, then we have a victim contest. Right, and I have they, to like bring out my resume of my right. own trauma and in like, order well, to be able to say know. that. And, and then they start; they're on the defensive, and they feel like they're I'm attacking them. And it's like I have friends like this where they feel like I'm attacking. I'm like I'm not attacking you. I'm just telling you. Um, from what I have seen in the world, I have met some people that have been through things that are so absolutely horrific. It's indescribable. Some of those people, and we've talked about some of them on this show. Yeah. I'm talking about horrible thing. Some of them have been able to rebuild their lives and have gotten to a point where you're so surprised and you're like, how does that happen? No one's arranging that. The right. world is not allowing that to happen. They are manifesting that with their ability to focus on positive things inside themselves and outside of themselves. Well, there's yeah. theories out there. Like you can basically like get addicted to the synaptic responses of like being hurt, being you know enraged. Oh, being mad and being yeah. hurt are so addictive. And like your body on a kind of like subconscious level, these are theories out there that you manifest these situations so you get these same interactions and the same, you know, negative uh you, know, you attract, feelings. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know that it's like this woo-woo whatever, but you definitely attract things that kind of resonate on the same frequency. I do think that you attract, you will you will become attracted to people. That's what you see, like women who who uh, always attract the same kind of man or whatever. Right. And then you when you, when I really get talking to them, you find out that they the issue that they keep experiencing with men uh, is an issue similar to what they felt from their dad. You know what I mean? Like this this sort of thing. And I think it really um, and I like I love i love so much of the millennial stuff that other uh you know because i'm like x generation but i love so much of i love that they're entitled i love that they feel entitled to not be raped i love that they yeah. don't i love that yeah. they feel entitled yeah. yeah i had no idea before the generation after me started talking about like that, that you can change your mind about having sex once everyone's clothes are off. You know how many just dicks I took just because yeah. I felt obligated? I love that they feel entitled right. to not put up with that. I love that they are changing the world. And I don't care that the pendulum is way over here. Like, I've learned so much uh, from this generation. And I love the idea of safe spaces. I love the idea of people, uh, like a place where I can learn about people that are different from me and stuff, but I don't like it as a place to hide from your own trauma. Let's not weaken ourselves by running, by trying to create a world where we never get triggered. I have a love hate with the millennial. Like I will be honest, there are certain things and I, and I know a lot of millennial, like I'm 33, but I know I'm, I'm close with like my friends, um, little brothers and sisters like i've always been that guy that i'm kind of like adopted into many different families yeah so i know a lot of different people of, of uh, different ages and 
I, the, oh, everything you're saying, I'm 100 percent hip to. What I will, what I will take issue with, is there's 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 this this what I consider to be learned fragility, where everyone at every moment is on the verge of a breakdown. Yeah. If they hear a thing they don't like, yeah, or if they encounter an idea that they don't find doesn't fit their preconceived notion of what should be the case, yeah. and everybody needs, um, you know. To be warned before something enters their space that they don't, you know. And so to me, I'm always somebody who says, listen, I'm a big believer in the idea that you have to be tough in yeah. life. Not tough in the callous, cynical sense, but tough in the sense that, like, if you are secure in your beliefs and the way that you see the world and you are a person that is, um, you know, a resilient person and that resilience comes from the confidence you have in your own ideas you should not be afraid of other ideas right you should be able to debate them yep. you should be able to knock them down you should be able to communicate effectively your stance and you shouldn't have to and your ideas should be able to be debated discussed too because if if not if you're afraid of that to me it's that you're either a not as confident in these ideas as you would have imagined. You're kind of like, wait a minute, what do I believe? Uh, or B, you believe you have this monopoly on truth, which I think is dangerous. If you believe you have, if you have a yeah. monopoly on absolute truth, I tend to believe that can be dangerous. And you're because that means you've shut down and you're unwilling to learn anything. Obviously, I'm not talking about the idea that you like somebody should be like, no, rape is great, and then like, all right, I'll debate you. But I mean, like, there there do seem to be instances where. The younger generation feels like they do have a monopoly on virtue. Well, it's also like you know, and again, it's great that you can positively uh, view you know the world and not get. But there's this thing where they like view everything through this filter of how it affects them, and then like they can be super positive about their life and not worry about where their iPhone comes from, how many you know six year old girls in Yemen are getting shot by Navy SEALs. Yeah, and I'm not talking privilege, yeah. like uh, uh, on on that. Front. Yeah. There does, I, yeah. I think this is more like what I'm talking about is a yeah. message for the privileged. Right. If that makes sense. Right. No, of uh, course. Uh, I like these are easy things for but me. But I do, as I do a, like you, you like you white said, listen, to say. No, <laughs> growing and learning and, and evolving is huge. And the idea that, like, yeah, it's nice that people don't walk around and say faggot. You know what I mean? Absolutely. To people. I think that's good. I think that's a good thing. Right. You know what I mean? I like that. People are kinder. Yes. That they, they're gentler. And, you know, like they think I about, like the idea yeah. for how we treat other people. But as the person on the receiving end of the triggering, I just think, like, I like to create the safe space for other people. Yeah. But, like, I don't want to live in a world where I never get triggered because there's nothing that helps me grow more than when I get triggered. And then I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know. My podcast partner and I, we, we, ha we trigger each other all the time because we're, like complete opposites and so there's something about him because he's he's very vulnerable and 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 stuff that makes me vulnerable and then i freak out because i've got and so there's there's been a lot of like uh triggering each other and i love it because it shows me things that i can still work on and i just don't like the idea of creating a world where we never have to deal with our pain and we never have yeah. to deal with our trauma and we never have to deal with anything that makes us uncomfortable because that's really how you grow. And I think that hiding from your pain makes you weak. Yeah. I think that's, I don't like pain pills because they lower your resolve and right. then you don't know how to deal with anything. Absolutely. What do you feel as a mother uh, when you talk to because it is amazing you see all these creepy messages from dudes that you you rightly fucking put out there and be like this guy's a scumbag when you talk to your kids about and, and this is an area where i i have no experience but when you're preparing women to go into this world you know knowing yeah. what we know now about the harvey wine scenes and stuff like that and and all of these people and then, by the way and the more subtle Harvey Weinstein, you know, it's yeah. not always a guy. And as a comedian, as a woman, how do you prepare somebody for this world as a woman to to go out into it? What what is knowing now what we know, or 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 will she be just better prepared because it's a different time? Or do do you think that real changes are going to happen? I have learned so much from the generation younger than me in the last five years. Or one of the rape culture thing. Yeah. Everyone started talking about that. And I've I've was molested as a kid. I've been yeah. uh, raped as an adult. Like I've had, and and I've I've slept with multiple men just to escape 
uh, where I thought I was going to get really hurt if I didn't just let them do what they wanted to do. And so my perception of it was always like, you got what you came for. You don't get shit else for me. I won't be your victim. You don't live in my head rent free. That's it. Like right here in this moment, that's what you got. And that's it. And I really felt like I was strong because of that. And I didn't even like to entertain the idea that the Brock whatever that dumpster Turner. piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't even like that we were were putting the onus on him. And so when my 23, not the putting the onus on him, right. but like uh, that I was triggered by the idea of that because I've been in that experience. Yeah. And it's like her, uh, I taught my daughter. Uh, and you fr- derive your own boys, strength from the idea. That, from the idea right, that I yeah. just like, the, so I'll take responsibility for getting drunk at that party. And that's that because then you didn't take anything from me. I'm the one that got drunk. And when I would get drunk, I would look around the room and be like, am I OK with everyone in this room fucking me? Because that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Like, that's just how I saw the world. So when my 23 year old uh, was about that age, I'm like, don't hang out with frat boys. Don't hang out with the jocks. They'll rape you. And that was, the, you know, if you do not drink with those dudes they will run a train on you while you're passed out and that was just the world that i understood and i put i told her like that's your response like know that that is going to happen don't drink and then think uh then be appalled tomorrow when you wake up and you're naked on a on a floor and they're you know because i got pushed down a flight of steps by some dudes that did this to me and so i just always felt like that was my i'm the one that made the decision to drink and i know who these garbage people are Um, that has shifted so much for me in the last few years. I still have to, unfortunately, tell my daughters that because that's still currently the world we live in. But I love that the entitled millennials were like, no, fuck that. Why don't you stop raping people? Yeah. You know, you're not entitled to my body just because I drank. And it's crazy. I just didn't even... You know, we just came from a, a generation that was like, well, this is the... I mean, I thought I was, like, uh, strong because I just right. accepted it. You, know? you never eliminate you know, the predators and you'll never eliminate rape, but we're cha- hopefully changing is the idea that it's part of the society. It's part of the culture. It's so, it's so far into the culture, uh, the way we raised boys. Yeah. When I was growing up. Yeah. That, like, no wonder they felt entitled right, to right. the body of women. And so I think we are raising, and that's another thing when people are complaining about these sensitive men and emotional right. men and everything else. It's like, that's the only way we're going to stop getting raped yeah. is if we stop uh, forcing boys not to have emotions yeah, as right. children. So let me, I, I don't, <laughs> not to say devil's advocate, but there's a lot of men out there who are sensitive. And are they call themselves male feminists? And maybe they are. Maybe they uh, maybe they do improv. Whatever. <laughs> and some of those men are victimizing women and get called out for it. Mm-hmm. And so it is interesting that there are some men that seem to be very good at kind of walking the walk and positioning themselves. Are are you ever wary of the guy who's too much of an Fuck ally? those men. Yeah, I see yeah. those snakes. You know what grass. I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. They're the same guy that when they take you on a date, they right. want to like, romance you and stuff. It's like, dude, I'm probably going to blow you by the end of this. Right, like, This right. is completely <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I see those guys from a million miles away. Fuck them. Okay. Uh, and they're not even really in touch with their, uh, you know, this is, right. it's the guys that are signing up for Bumble because they're trying to score the chicks that they can't find. Yeah, fuck yeah. them. Um, and that's a huge in comedy and improv. That's a huge. Those the the feminine. I'm not like a little bit leery as soon as you say feminist too quick to me as a as a as a just be a right. dude that's not a piece of shit. I don't right. need your title. That right. makes me suspicious. Yeah. Just don't be a piece of shit. Yeah. You know, and I, I try to practice that in my life. Like, I want to be an ally to groups. You don't hear me talking about it. I just right. I'm doing what needs to. I'm having the uncomfortable conversations with the. With the people behind the scenes, you know, yeah. I don't need to announce it on Facebook. Do you think the idea, I mean, of course, you know, the feminist movement has been done a lot of positive things. But, yeah, yeah, the idea that, like, respecting women is a fe- is feminism, not just normal. Just be a human yeah. being. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I remember... Uh, well, like even the, this is not happening clip, you know, I de- there's uh, so many people, uh, first funny, first female that ever made me laugh. Like they think that, that yeah. that's right. a compliment. <laughs> but then I can't believe how many in my YouTube, then they went to my YouTube and they're like, you're my favorite female comedian. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're still ranked that way. But right. I, it was 2011, maybe 
12, I was still getting told, uh, I'd love to have you on the show, but we already got a woman comic on the show. Right. And I remember growing, like, you know, when I was younger, I used to listen to, like, O&A and all that kind of stuff. And, like, it is a pervasive thing, the idea of, like, cause for a while, you, you know, I'm not proud of it, but you're like, oh, yeah, women, women funny kind of thing. They, they, po- they pose this question. And then, like, over the past 15, 20 years, you realize how dumb that was. Yeah. But it's something that's, like, ingrained into these, like, guys' mind. And I'm not saying we don't have responsibility for it, but, yeah, it's a systemic kind yeah. of... No, yeah. it was so you got generations just raised, and we have evolved so much. And when people complain about the the extreme side of the things, like you have to have people uh, constantly talking about it uh, uh, in order to get you know the pendulum has to swing all the way right. over here, you know, because now everyone's like, "Where's the nuance?" And I was like, "Oh, now you guys want nuance." <laughs> What's my big? Uh, I didn't hear anything about fucking nuance yeah. ten years ago. What's my big pet peeve? Whether it's racism or like fem- women's issues and stuff, it's like people now are starting to go like. Oh, Oh, it's going the other direction. It's going too far. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah. When you had the change, like for instance, when, when slavery ended, it's not like we just immediately said, "All right, black people are equal and everything was cool." We fucking fought tooth and nail. Like, white men fought tooth yeah. and nail against giving anyone their rights, against giving women their rights. So yeah, what do you think is going to happen when people finally get the social capital to, yeah. you know, exercise some change? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's going to overreach a little bit at least. Yeah. Well, and I can't imagine uh, being told. Uh, your whole life that racism doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> right. When you right. are a, a yeah. daily victim of systemic right. racism. Like, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah. off. If I yeah. have one more people nailing, uh, kneeling at a at a football game yeah. uh, argument. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Like, are you kidding? That's <laughs> right, what you're... Right, right, uh, right. Where was your outrage when kids were getting shot by cops? Uh, none. So none. they had to get your attention, which is at your dumbass football game. Right, yeah. Uh, for you not to see the fact that at least now you're talking about it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. What's well, the other thing too is it's like these kids that are marching for gun restrictions, you know? Like a lot of people are like, let's not listen to them. They're fucking kids. And it's they're like, kids. they're getting shot. Yeah. They're getting shot. They got- like, they're the ones, you know? And by the way, not only in schools, but on the south side of Chicago, everywhere. Like in areas, like it's predominantly young people that are getting affected by these lax. Like people complain, like, oh, it's like it's just an emotional reaction where people are responding emotionally. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry, Socratic method didn't work in this situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. No, and the, and the the whole like they're kids. Uh, this is their world. Right. This is the, the, right. You, you're getting phased out, and I don't know why every generation wants to cling to their way of doing things, and then can't just recognize. Don't you remember being 18 right. years old? Right. Uh, your way's never coming back. So right. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. You didn't enjoy it. You complained the whole way through it. Right. But I'm glad now that you, uh, uh, now that you remember it fondly. But it's never coming back. Right. And the idea, I love it. I love you. That's how we're gonna get uh, uh, rid of these lifelong senators and shit. Yeah. Keep talking shit. These kids are gonna be voting in two years. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. I did the whole the whole shitting on the kids, and then they're children. These are children yeah. in the the government. That are saying, like they are, uh, these kids are just speaking their mind. They just watch a bunch of their friends get killed, and it's and then the 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 uh, shade being thrown from grown ass men. Right. Yeah. It's that's another one that it's I crazy. can't even. Take. Yeah. Like oh, they're just they're not though. They're almost adults, and they're this is their this is their world. Yeah. Rick Santorum was telling him, like you know, at one point this week that uh, instead of uh, focusing on this, why don't you focus on something that you can help people, like learn CPR, so you can help them after they get shot. And it's yeah. Wow. Just insanity. I mean, and then to arm the teachers, arm the custodians, arm yeah. the... Let's give them a bucket of rocks. Give yeah. them all. And that's that's the thing when it's like, this is these are religious. Like, yeah. when you believe in any political ideology... Uh, as fervently as people believe in religion, you set you tend to say ludicrous things. Yeah. So exactly. arm the teachers right. is a ludicrous thing. And this is going to be the kind of thing where I think uh, who's the justice? Do you see the New York Times had the yeah, I just, John I saw, Paul Suter, I think yeah, it was. Yeah, I saw it on my phone. Like Supreme uh, Court Justice. He's, he's 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 advocating getting rid of the Second Amendment altogether. Right. Because actually doesn't defend firearms. It hasn't for two hundred years. Right. Whatever. But the point is, like, yeah, that's probably what's going to win the day eventually. And then people are going to complain. Well, you're overreach it took all the guns well you wouldn't put any regulations in you wouldn't yeah. allow any you know uh like just get rid of assault weapons even they go oh they, they could do the same thing with uh right. with regular rifles like yeah but you don't feel like so Rambo can you. when you do so it. then yeah. get right. over it right what but before we go because you, you you've been so good it's amazing that 
you got to find someone who used to do math to put it together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, imagine, you know, like it really is shocking how, 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 how on point you are and how, and how, so. My, What's my, interesting, though, so, yeah. like, what I find really interesting, you, everyone talks about like taking like DMT or even like LSD and, and getting these insights. And like, you don't really hear a lot. You, you seem to have gotten like a lot of very on point insights from meth. I did, I think, just from the, law, the 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 wide variety of life experience that I had. Yeah. Like, I did a five-year uh, stint in Christianity. And just, yeah. like, uh, all of these things collectively, I think, just gave me a very objective view uh, of the world. So I, like, you know, I, I ended up being the world's filthiest life coach. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it really does feel like that. Like, what, what would you, you know, we, you, you, people ask you the question about, like, what... What's your perfect scenario? Like, what would you love? Would you would you love to do uh, a podcast and then just travel around doing uh, you know stand up storytelling things like that? Would you like to have a a show like where? Because this is like there's so much good stuff there. Yeah. In addition to your comedy, there's like a lot of stuff where I feel like you could really help people and you could really talk to people. And it, that's not a put on like that's legit. Yeah. Do you ever feel like Comedy feels too small of a world to do a lot of the things that I think you're you're suited to do. I want to change. Uh, I want to open people's minds, uh, yeah. and so I want everything I do to be that. And so my comedy, I want to put all of my pain and trauma out on display and be like, see, uh, we we can get through this. And I want. I've written a couple scripted uh, series that I'm sitting on right now that are very much like to to change. And because I, I I feel like I can see everyone's perception, and I would just like to. I feel like I can explain to everyone. Every everyone else's through things like comedy and writing. Um, my ultimate comedy goal is to be able to do theaters and cause I homeschool my kids. Okay. And I would love to, uh, be on tour, uh, homeschooling my kids and teach them about the world by taking them out and showing them all the different, cause traveling, you learn so much. If you live in the same city your whole life, you just think that's what the world is. You have no idea that it's a completely different world. One state over. Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, I have been playing with the idea of, uh, of some type of, uh, disgusting life coach, just cause I think it's funny, like how much I learned, like everything I ever needed to know I learned on meth. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like comedy's amazing, but I think that everything you're saying is so valuable in addition to being funny that there needs to be. You need to do something bigger. Like, I feel like people should go and hear you talk. And, yeah. like, I really feel that way. Like, I feel like seeing you at, like, like I'm going to be at Magoobies this weekend. And it's like, <laughs> that's where I belong. You know what I mean? Like, I belong at Magoobies. Like, because I, and hopefully I belong in, like, a theater one day doing comedy. But it's like, what I think you have is this really interesting, pr unique perspective. I didn't get as much out of drug use as you did. I got, <laughs> I mean, you got a lot out of it. I got, uh, I got some things out of it. Um, but I, your ability to communicate them is is rare. And wow, I think that you. there's like no, there, there's got to be something where, you know, you can go out there and uh, because it's like, and I again, not to not to be not to be overly complimentary, but like it is a De Stefano vibe. Of like you can communicate stuff that other people can't. You know Thank what you. I mean? Wow. So we're gonna leave it there. But listen, um, well you're gonna edit this together anyway. So you'll put this in the middle of the conversation, or who knows? We'll talk about it after. Great idea, <laughs> Jessica Reed. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. TimDillonComedy.com for dates. I will be at Magoobies this weekend in Baltimore. If you're listening live. Uh, I'll be at Moon Tower in uh, Austin in April. Uh, also, I will be over this summer in Chicago, at Zanies, Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, Comedy Connection, Providence, Rhode Island. If you're in any of those cities, please start to grab your tickets so you're committed to coming. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. New dates added. I'll be in Ireland at the Vodafone Festival if we have any fans in Ireland, going back to the mother country. And... Uh, Netflix will be out hopefully this summer. We'll see what happens uh, when. We don't know. We'll let you know. We'll announce that. Sign up for the bus tour show, timdillancomedy.com. We'll email you for tickets. Um, and a couple of big announcements that are going to come. Can't really talk about them yet, but some cool things that are going to happen um, 
Me and Ari Shafir went to go see Jordan Peterson. We went backstage. We'll talk about that next time. We'll talk about your epic, epic set. Thank you. At the Kate May Winery. And uh, the great Jessa Reed. Find her on everything. Follow her. She's the best. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. All right. Later.